My name is Dimitris Psaltis. I'm, uh, I'm a professor in uh, PFL in, uh, in Switzerland. And together with Ephthemis, whom you already met, we'll be coordinating uh, the next panel. The next panel, the topics are energy and environment. Of course, immense topics in, uh, in Greece and the, and the planet. And then the main goal, again, is to see how HIAS can contribute in, in addressing some of these issues by collaborations between uh, uh, scientists of the diaspora and, and, uh, and our colleagues in Greece. Uh, we start with, uh, with uh, our keynote speech. And uh, uh, we're very, very, very proud to have and happy to have Anna Stefanopoulou, who's a professor at the University of Michigan, and professor of mechanical engineering. She got her PhD also at the same place in, in Michigan. And like pretty much everybody else here, she was a, uh, uh, she got her uh, for formation or her, uh, her education at uh, Metrovion here, here in Greece. Her area of expertise is uh, uh, combustion and, uh, and electrochemistry, all related to energy issues. So, Anna, I give you the floor. <laughs> Now you can hear me. Um, so, yeah, esteemed board and colleagues, academic colleagues from Greece, and I have to say also some friends, really good to be here today. Um, this is actually an institute, I'm very honored. This is an institute where it gave me my first scholarship, right? Uh, a lot of us have gotten the scholarships and, and uh, it's a small monetary value, but frankly, it gives us a great boost for confidence, for um, working and, and doing more research in whatever area we wanted to do. And back then and still now, the thing I am most interested and in, love to do is just to work on big, powerful machines. In fact, controlling big, powerful machines. Um, and uh, you'll see today uh, specifically to talk about machines that they're at the same time are respectful for our planet and uh, safe for uh, our lives. Um, in preparing for today's talk, I, I have learned that Greece is doing a great deal, a uh, lot of effort in decarbonizing and uh, pursuing sustainable non-carbon type of technologies. And um, I'm sure um, there are going to be a lot of problems coming up and difficult roadblocks that we have to deal with as we execute uh, this problem, the, execute the uh, our plan, especially with the uh, unfortunate events, terrible events in, in Ukraine. So we're here today to talk about energy, the environment, and of course that is uh, uh, looming in front of us, that, that big issue. Um, I am here also to say that uh, batteries are going to be, my dear friends, a big important aspect of our de decarbonization. And that's what I will be talking today, trying to uh, glean out the topic that uh, could be also very interested, interesting in, in, in Greece. Um, so as I said, I have a, a naval architecture uh, diploma in marine engineering from Metovio. I have a PhD from electrical engineering. I teach in mechanical engineering. <laughs> and I am doing chemical engineering um, because it's, it's about batteries and controlling combustion. So um, I, I and, and that's what I will talk about it today. It's actually the last decade I've been working more and more on, on instead of combustion in, in batteries. And I'll t tell you a little bit, uh, uh, you know, I started in designing machine rooms in um, big fishery boats for uh, Greece. And again, this is what I love doing. It was a lot of grease, heat, noise and uh, the smell of diesel fuel. Um, my diplomatic key professors um, helped me get a C grant and go to the University of Michigan uh, to work on automated navigation. And you'll say, automated navigation what? In the Midwest, in the middle of the United States? Uh, well, actually, if you look at this map, uh, this is Michigan, and you can see all around it, there are the Great Lakes. And in fact, Michigan is uh, a state that has the largest coastline, almost the same with the uh, continental uh, Greece, uh, if we uh, take away the islands. Um, so there are actually a lot of parallels um, and, and a robust shipping industry that we have in, in uh, the Great Lakes, and that's why I went uh, over there to, uh, to do my master's. And then, um, of course, the gravitational uh, force, or I guess the gravitational knowledge 
uh, force of, of the automotive industry in Michigan uh, pulled me very soon after that. And then I started developing work and doing my PhD in uh, automation of internal combustion engines for, for cars. And so I became an emission expert um, which maybe some of you uh, uh, know me uh, like that. I, conduct, I conducted great, great research right next to industry. Actually, I did uh, almost all my PhD, half at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and half of it at Ford Research Labs. So that's another amazing thing that we do in the United States, working together with industry. Um, and um, Back then and, and now even, even more, we, we fully understand and we have full responsibility of how much CO we have actually produced. And this chart shows very clearly the 20% contribution globally of transportation to the CO2 emissions and the global warming. And you can see the contribution to passenger vehicles and other type of uh, trucks and commercial freight. So very important area and, and of course, um, uh, this chart shows globally the numbers, but in Greece, I, I looked it up, it's very similar. It's actually 19%, uh, even with the decrease that we saw recently with the COVID um, and other economic problems. Uh, so in Greece, it's about 19%. In the United States, it's much larger. It's, we're closer to 30%. And if you go to areas like California, and my colleagues at the panel is going, they're going to talk a little bit about, about California, transportation is 40% of CO2. Um, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem. Um, this chart here uh, shows the gains in average fuel efficiency for a fixed weight vehicle, for a, imagine a, a paradigm vehicle across the last 100 years. So we, we engineers should be really proud of ourselves. Uh, this is what we have done. Look at the number, two trillion gallons of fuel that we have actually saved. Uh, by developing fuel emissions and fuel economy techniques for internal combustion engines. Um, well, as I said, I worked in that area. In this chart here, um, I know I have a, a bit of a soup of acronyms that a lot of you probably don't know. Um, I worked on variable valve technology, so wherever you see VVTs, uh, that's actually variable valve technologies. And then I also worked on turbocharged engines, and that's the turbocharged downsizing that you see over there. And what the axis show in the x-axis, they show basically what? U.S. technology dollars, so the cost of technology. Every time we had to improve fuel efficiency, that is the y-axis that goes up, and we improved fuel efficiency, apologies for my MPG in the US units, <laughs> miles per gallon, we had to uh, add actuators and sensors to be able to actually control tighter emissions and improve fuel efficiency. So we added content, we added cost. And as you can see, this thing climbs, and it climbs and it rises and it goes steeper and steeper, which means that we actually had to start uh, talk about cost effectiveness of technology we're introducing for being able to be fuel efficient. And um, you probably uh, uh, all know in the US uh, and, and across the world, we, are, uh, we dealt uh, several years ago with a diesel gate. Uh, and diesels indeed, they were providing the highest fuel efficiency, but they also required the exhaust after treatment that make them very expensive, of course, when things work correctly and not, not, not cheating. Um, I know in Greece, um, many of you know me perhaps from the diesel gate, uh, but that particular diesel gate cheating was a, a huge awakening and a, and a big transformation for industry that made the industry itself switch and start focusing in batteries and electrochemical energy storage. This chart here shows us how and, and, and see this chart by also remembering the previous one as internal combustion cost was going up as we were improving, improving uh, efficiency, the same time battery cost was going down. Right? So you can see decades, uh, a decade of improvement in technology uh, gains, breakthroughs really in battery technology. And I'm specifically charting here, I'm, I'm graphing lithium ion technology, lithium ion batteries. So um, the gray area shows what uh, the predictions are about electrification, specifically electric batteries in automobiles. Um, the chart to the right 
It shows also, actually, you can see that one red dot. It, it was announced last week. This is uh, the um, KTL. It's a Chinese company that they actually managed to break uh, through, actually achieve the goal we have in the United States for battery technologies to be able to be uh, at the same uh, scale, capacity, range, and uh, life of uh, an internal combustion engine fossil fuel uh, driven vehicle. Of course, there is a lot of technology going on over there, but I will, as I said, I, I looked at the literature, just trying to prepare for this talk, really, really excited and honored to be here. And I said, okay, we are going to electrification of transportation. Let's take a look at Europe and Greece. This is the chart I found. I'm sure you can all find it really easily. Unfortunately, that shows that Greece has the oldest fleet and therefore, right, the most polluting fleet in uh, EU. This uh, table, I, I managed to summarize uh, the average fleet of the European Union. So it's about 12 uh, years for cars and 13 years for buses and about the same for trucks. That's the middle column. And you can see um, the youngest fleets uh, are happening in Luxembourg and Austria and different other countries when it comes to buses. And you can see in the column to the right, Greece. In Greece, we have cars that are um, 17 years old on average. That means that they are much older. And here I have to say, I checked with my nephew and, and, and his car is 19 years uh, old. So, you know, it runs in, even in our family. Um, and, and of course, buses, 19 years buses that we have. So when we are talking about electrification, uh, I was like, I was scratching my head. Uh, Petros and the rest invited me to talk about actionable, um, uh, <laughs> um, you know, motions and movements that we can do and maybe some suggestions and, and where we can help. I would love to be able to work with you in these uh, two areas, which I think, in my opinion, could be the strategy and a priority uh, to be on the forefront of, of the technology and the research. So the strategy for me is bus electrification. Electrifying our mass transit it would be the first thing to do in um, our metropolis, our metro areas that are very congested. Charging infrastructure is gonna be really hard to achieve. And um, you know, obviously many other problems associated with uh, cleaning our grid that I know it's moving really fast, but there is a lot more work to be done. Um, and. Um, you know, given the time, I, I decided to focus on the second one, which is battery second life, which, you know, it's not actually very well known, so I'd, I'd like the time to, to do that. Uh, so battery second life, um, the idea here is to have to really focus in Greece. After all, we have such an old fleet. We might as well just recognize and, and accept the fact that we might end up having a lot of second-hand electric vehicles that are coming to us. Uh, from Europe. And so we need to be able to prepare for this kind of second-hand electric vehicles. And also maybe we can become the hub, the industry hub, in actually managing all these aged automotive batteries to actually repurpose them to our grid so that we can uh, green the grid. So um, in this, uh, this uh, second, uh, uh, these this first two strategies or these two strategies are satisfying what I, I also consider extremely important in the energy transition, which is uh, equity and economic growth. Um, let me uh, therefore try to go a little bit into that. Um, hub for a second hand EV. We learn to develop techniques and to build our workforce, uh, how to repair and how to refurbish. We actually, um, batteries are 30 to 40% of the cost of an EV. We cannot afford throwing them out or even recycling them. And even recycling takes energy to break it down to raw material and bring it back up to make it a shiny, nice battery again. So a 30 to 40% of the energy uh, of an electric vehicle and the cost is the CO2 therefore, is actually on the battery. 2.5 billion US dollars industry is on remanufacturing engines. This industry needs to transition and it needs to move. And frankly, I don't know, maybe I can do a show of hands. How many people they have in their block, the same place that they live, or maybe within three blocks, a body shop, like an auto shop in Greece? You don't? 
Oh, I see so many, maybe because I'm tuned, you know, I'm into, I'm into that. <laughs> so I think auto shops are just everywhere, perhaps because we have an aged fleet, and so we need a lot of auto shops to fix our cars. Uh, you know, all this kind of uh, training and, and technology, uh, we can actually, I don't know, develop it here. I, th I think that would be exciting. Uh, as I said, 6,000 6, machine shops in North America are dealing actually with remanufacturing engines. Okay, so hub for a second life. Let's become experts in repurposing automotive aged packs. Uh, repurposing batteries from automotive to the grid in 10 years or in eight years, it would basically allow us to level the battery competition between the grid and the uh, cars and therefore manage the cost. We should be able to decarbonize the grid and, 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 and help with the, the, the uh, regulation, frequency regulation. Uh, my colleagues at the panel will talk a little bit about these difficulties. Improving fast charging um, because we will need a, a storage behind the meter and supporting building decarbonization, which is extremely hard. Okay, so I'm saying these things and some of you are scratching your head and, see, and, and you're thinking, oh, what is he talking about? Batteries, big packs are really dangerous, right? They're high voltage, they have some of them hadrons, hadrons, some of them thousands of cells. The Tesla pack has, uh, you know, something like 5,000 cells. So what are we talking about? This is a picture of a, of a Ford pack. Uh, yeah, I'm a Fordy in, in some sense because I worked there and I have also the endowed chair of the uh, William Clay Ford technology professor at the University of Michigan. And so we work with them very closely in, in taking packs and trying to understand you know, how they age, how they're used and how they evolve in, in life. And, and you can see here some of my students and colleagues uh, uh, doing a, what we call a tear down, so taking packs and, and taking them apart very carefully together with the industry safety experts that um, mapping them and then developing our CAD drawings that will let us uh, do our thermal management and try to really understand how to develop a cooling system and how to uh, uh, check and, and do the testing about uh, the cells, the individual cells. And this is a picture that looks like when we do thermo electrochemical and we're trying to understand the behavior of the battery. So these are the packs, as you can see here, hadrons of cells. So these are uh, two modules, the front and the back. Uh, they look like couches <laughs> in the back of your car uh, or underneath your car for most, most, most electric vehicles. And um, the cooling system is very important because temperature would actually degrade the cells very quickly. And we're trying to develop the cooling system to have homogeneous cell-to-cell, -cell, like reduce the cell-to-cell -cell variability. And as you can see here, we develop models the two lines in the graphs is model and data. So this is a, a system, a, a virtual, think about a digital twin that uh, lives in our computers that actually emulates, depending on the cooling system, takes data continuously from the battery management and checks and adapts the model we have so that it's always correct and it recognizes which cells might be suffering more than others. So I'm talking about aging. Okay, I'm gonna uh, pull out a little bit and, and give you uh, my view or you know, the, so, something to remember. Batteries age and they, f they are a lot like humans and they hate to be overworked. They hate, hate pressure, external pressure, high temperature or, and low temperature. The same human temperature they love. Um, and, you know, we are diverse in chemistry, shape, size. In fact, in, when it comes to batteries, I wish we were not so diverse and we had some st standardization. Uh, but right now, it's the beginning of the industry, so this is where we are. Uh, we are statistical faulty, meaning that as we manu get manufactured, there's going to be parts per million, right? Sigma uh, engineering, Six Sigma engineering says that there are going to be so many uh, parts per, per million when we manufacture that they will be faulty and all cells must die. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, the same with us. So how do batteries degrade? Uh, look at this graph. Uh, what we see externally are two things, two important things. Uh, the first chart shows capacity reducing, dropping the capacity. Think about the range of the vehicle. Capacity drops, as you can see, 
as amp hours go through. Amp hours means the current you draw from it. That means you use the battery, you're going to degrade it, period. The question is how are you going to degrade it? And the color lines here are showing how fast you can degrade. The red are for high temperature, and they're not really high temperature. They're just 45 degrees um, Celsius. And, and, and then uh, in the chart next to it is resistance increases. So when the resistance increases, that means you cannot deliver high power. So your power drops, your range drops, hey, the battery is aged. So this is what we see externally. And then we have the battery management system. That's my stuff. This is the stuff I do in the lab. So um, this is what we need to take care, which is inside now. We go from the pack to the cell. And sorry for being geeky here and showing you so much, but it's, I love this chart. It shows the anode, the cathode, and the separator, which is the core of the battery. And it shows actually all the sort of you know, good and bad things that are happening as lithium intercalates and gets inside the material. Sometimes it piles up and it cannot actually get inside the material, and, and therefore it creates dendrites that can short the battery and create uh, a thermal runaway. We'll talk a little bit about that. Or the particle um, uh, starts cracking because there is stress, internal stress, <coughs> and because it's cracking, it creates film of, um, you know, I'm going to call it gunk, but it's actually, we call it a solid electrolyte interface, and that increases the resistance, and that resistance, remember, is what drops the power. And then we actually, uh, you know, all these things are what we need to worry about and what we need to protect for. Uh, what I'm showing to the right is what we measure. We measure only voltage of all the cells. So only the electrical signal. And what we can control is actually even worse. We only control current. So we can power, do power denials. So we can say, don't take so much current, take so much current. And what we do, so obviously what you can think is I call it like driving blind, because there's so many things we have to watch to the left and right of us. But actually, it is uh, we get only very few signals, only electrical signals. So what I call. Um, helping uh, the, instead of driving blind, is what we do, the battery estimation, where we're basically developing the digital twin that I talked to you about. And with a digital twin, this is how it looks like, and I'm not going to go through the equations. But you see basically equations that describe what happens inside not just the cell and the electrodes, the anodes and cathodes of individual cells, but we actually model what happens inside particles, like little particles that are actually uh, you know, extremely small size on the, in the uh, microns. And we are computing as uh, we take data, and at the same time, our digital twin allows us to uh, be able to continuously tune our parameters and have a model that captures all the phenomena. And at the end, uh, we take data from the road, uh, not just vehicles, but also energy storage systems, and looking all the time to actually understand the capacity fade, the resistance increase, and predict forward. Because remember, I was here to tell you about second life. So obviously, there is not going to be a second life if my model predicts that this battery is going to actually start decelerating this capacity dropping really quickly, and therefore, it's better to recycle it. Right, so, so these are the type of things that decisions industry needs, and that's why we work next to them to develop these models. Um, they need to decide about warranties. They need to decide about resale value when they're doing second-hand vehicles. And they need to decide, again, they're um, um, repurposing it on the grid. Um, we do fun things, kind of, you know, crazy things sometimes. Obviously, these are models. And as I said, we don't measure too much in a real vehicle. But in the lab, we can actually go in actually more than the lab. We can go to a nuclear reactor. And the nuclear reactor can actually give us a beam. And we can do the inverse of an x-ray and see inside the battery as it actually operates where the lithium goes between anode and cathode and verify our models even on the single cell level. This here you see actually 10 layers of cells operating. And I have a movie, but um, I will uh, keep on going. Um, so yeah, we have our students, you know, I call them our brave students that, you know, we can actually put in front of the, this is a reactor, a nuclear reactor, and this is the beam. And um, uh, Zinfan was there uh, actually imaging, well, not when the beam was on, right? He would go outside in the bunker. 
Um, so we do also a lot of equipment in the lab, uh, things like uh, that they actually measure what we saw when we did this beaming. Uh, and this imaging, we actually need, didn't even, did, did not only see concentrations inside the battery, but we actually saw the battery swelling. So batteries are actually when they charge and discharge, it's like breathing, charging, discharging. They're actually swelling. The lithium goes inside the carbon atoms and it opens up the diatomic structure and makes the electron swell. Of course, the other side of the, electro the electrode, uh, it's actually contracting. So what you see is the combined contraction and, and swelling. And we can actually measure it in the lab. What this graph shows is that uh, we can take current and, and this uh, is voltage. So you can see that actually gets to be more and more and f more frequent. And then you see this swelling. So batteries are actually, again, like humans, we breathe when we charge this charge, and that's a reversible expansion. And at the same time, unfortunately, as we age, we gain weight, and that's the irreversible expansion. A lot of us do, but not all. Um, and, and so what, what you see is that as this batteries, how many of you have uh, had problems with your iPads or your, uh, your computers where the battery gets swollen or your cell phone and cracked? Yeah, yep, yeah, thank you. So you know what I'm talking about. There is a big deal. I mean, this is an area that as we are constraining our packs, uh, we don't let them expand. And therefore, because we don't let them expand, now the stress grows inside and breaks the particles. And that's what actually now we understand aids the batteries. And so we really need to get more and more into that. And that's what we do in my lab. Um, and, and it's actually this graph, it, all, it also shows that we need to optimize that pressure we're applying to the battery. This graph shows that uh, we call it the Goldilocks principle, right? Like if you apply not enough, enough pressure, then you can degrade your battery very fast. This graph shows. But if you put more pressure, then it's better and better and the, batteries leave, the battery leaves longer. But after too much pressure, again, it will hurt again. So trying to understand the physics. Okay, a lot of you here, uh, when they talk about batteries and electrification, they care about cost, charging infrastructure, and safety, right? I, at least in the United States, that's we having recalls and, and we have a lot of issues in that front. Uh, so looking into signals and measuring uh, signals that are the uh, Archangeli or Proagili or, you know, <laughs> telling us about uh, uh, faults, impeding fault, it would be um, it would be great, um, and indeed batteries have a lot of energy. They are that's why we love them. Lithium-ion batteries actually have inside them five to eight times more energy what they can cycle. And this graph what I'm showing you is for the same range of travel. Uh, an electric a battery uh, has actually twice as much energy stored in the battery, meaning that if there is an event, a fault, then there's going to be more energy released and more uh, abruptly, potentially, if we don't develop and engineer the system. Of course, we are engineering, you know, I'm going to say the hell out of the system, and we're going to make it work really well. And in all honesty, batteries are not more going to be more dangerous, or they're not even now more dangerous than internal combustion engines. We do have fires in them, and we learn how to manage them. Uh, in the lab, we try to understand how things work in a normal sense and what actually we need to be doing in an abnormal case. Uh, so we actually start abusing. We have abuse uh, labs that we do a lot of abuse scenarios, and we have the cells swelling, like the picture I showed you earlier, like this. Um, and then, of course, when they swell a lot, they will vent. Uh, these vents are actually uh, flammable, and so they have to, we have to change the way we're thinking. Right now, when we are uh, initiating a problem with a fire, we, what we're doing is we're starving from oxygen. We are closing, we are enclosing the system. In a battery, we cannot, we should not enclose it. We should actually vent it because these hydrocarbons, the battery includes inside it oxygen. And so you don't need oxygen from the outside. It will actually uh, have metal oxides. It will give the oxygen and the fuel and the oxygen will keep the fire going and in fact reigniting months and sometimes, well, weeks and sometimes months uh, later. So we're actually developing even systems for deactivation. Uh, in the US, we have a lot of uh, issues 
not just from automotive batteries, but also just your little cell phones or toys that you buy for kids that they have lithium ion batteries that they're little ones and end up at the waste. They end up at garbage and they dealt with garbage uh, systems and, and containers and then they get crashed. And of course, when you crash a battery, what happens? Fire. And of course, it, then it can ignite the uh, associated uh, uh, waste around it. Um, we're working a lot in um, developing next generation batteries uh, in anodes that they have solid state electrolyte that it's not flammable. And uh, before we get there, we will be having also batteries that they have silicon instead of graphite, and they will swell a lot more. In fact, uh, they swell three to six times more silicon. I know actually some experts here on that. And then in the cathode side, we are actually going more and more towards nickel and less cobalt because of the ethical issues, uh, because cobalt, a lot of it is, uh, is mined in Congo. Uh, the only other country that has cobalt is Finland, and I found out that we actually have traces of cobalt in our country. But, as I said, next generation batteries will have a lot more nickel, and from what I heard and read recently, just preparing for this talk, uh, we have 80% of the production of nickel in Europe, in here in Greece. So, this is an opportunity and something that we can do, and again, in the spirit of making bridges for the United States and for my state, Michigan uh, and Greece, we look very similar. I superimpose here the um, Mediterranean uh, to the uh, US continent and you can see the lakes and you can see the size and the coastline and the industry. And also I have to say up north in Michigan, we also have uh, ore and uh, type of mining that we have here in the United States in the Ptolemaida area that I know there are a lot of struggles in uh, decarbonizing. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for, for this opportunity.